Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Michael Taylor, manager of the Simplify Healthcare ETF, ticker symbol PINK, P-I-N-K. We talk to Mike about his background and transition from a scientist to investment professional. We get an overview of how he categorizes the healthcare sector, where he's finding opportunities, and how he looks to drive long-term shareholder value by picking healthcare names with upside. One really cool thing about the ETF is the profits from the fund help support the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Organization. So there's a charitable drive as part of the fund's mission and existence. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Simplify's Michael Taylor. Hi, Mike. How are you? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. We wanted to have you on to talk uh, about healthcare investing, how you go about selecting healthcare companies for the portfolio that you run, some of the interesting trends in the industry, um, and then just how you kind of go about thinking, building up portfolio of these healthcare companies and stocks. And, um, you know, if we have time, maybe we can get to some of your views on the macro economy and the economic backdrop uh, toward the end. So hopefully people want to hang out and uh, stick around for that. But I think to start, let's just, because this is very neat. I don't think there's anyone else doing this in the ETF space. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but the ETF that you're in charge of, that you run the Simplify Healthcare ETF, ticker symbol pink, I, I believe it's the only ETF that donates its proceeds to a charity. Is that correct from what you know? Yes. Pink is the only ETF, to my knowledge, that is of the true essence of impact investing, where uh, the fees, the net fees and my compensation all go to the Susan G. Komen Foundation for Breast Cancer. So it is a way for investors to do well, if not great, and do good, if not very good and good for humanity. Well, we're, I'm sure there's a great backstory in terms of the idea. Like, where did you get the idea to do an ETF that gives the proceeds to charity? Um, it actually came uh, brainstorming with uh, Mike Green a number of years ago. And I don't know if you're familiar with Mike Green, but he plays a very large role at the Simplify family of funds where he's a part manager, part owner, and a wonderful guy. And he uh, helped greatly to put this together. And... Uh, you know, hey, do you want to do something entirely different? And uh, the answer was, well, heck yeah. Well, what do you think? And so we, we concocted this. And uh, my goal was to uh, deliver superior performance at a fraction of the cost and for it all to go to charity. And it seems to have worked out uh, well. Now, it's sort of charity, I should disclaim. I think I am the largest shareholder in pink. So uh, I'll have to check. It changes from day to day, but I should be around the largest shareholder in pink. Uh, so our incentives are aligned. It's my money too. So I treat it like my own uh, personal account in uh, healthcare. And that way, everybody else also gets to benefit from what I'm doing. As, yeah, we're, as, we're, as of course, the charity, Susan G. Komen. Yeah, we're big fans of Mike, by the way. Mike's been on the podcast a few times. He actually was our guest about two episodes ago. How did you decide to use the Susan G. Coleman Foundation for your charity? Um, do you have a personal connection to that? You know, I don't, but there hasn't been anyone who isn't touched by cancer and breast cancer. Every family uh, has been. So it, it's important that everyone is touched by it. But also Susan G. Coleman has the greatest reach. And if you take a look at where this pink is going, uh, it's going to a place where uh, the checks could be quite substantial coming out of it. And we needed somebody who could actually take that check and do something meaningful with it. And that's why it needed to be a large charity, something that I could get behind. They do an awful lot of primary research in breast cancer. And I understand that. And I, everyone has been touched again by breast cancer, myself included, though we haven't had anyone in my family. I don't know any family that hasn't been touched. So it was very important for me to be able to give back and give back in a big way. And it's something that, that has a, um, well, a sustainability to it, meaning that I don't have to go and write a personal check for a million dollars every year. I'm making it right here for them 
and making profits for everyone else at the same time. So what I'm really giving of is my time. Yeah, you know, right. it, it's a great charity. And as, as you mentioned, all of us have been touched, you know, in some way or another by breast cancer. Um, so it, it's really cool what you guys are doing. Um, I believe you are the first scientist we've ever had on the, uh, on the Excess Returns podcast, um, which is just another reminder to me that I'm not smart, which happens a lot in these, uh, in these episodes. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you did. Like, what kind of scientist were you? Um, well, so I was the first crop of molecular biologists the ones that actually had a textbook that was called molecular biology. And I didn't realize it at the time, this is 25 years ago. I didn't realize how novel that was to come onto Wall Street with a molecular background. And I ended up focusing in on uh, virology and gene therapy, the very beginnings of gene therapy. Now we have a number of uh, mechanisms and compounds that are out to treat uh, diseases in the form of gene therapy. But 25 years ago, it was just a pipe dream. And it's so wonderful to see that many, many things that I worked on 25 years ago are now in humans and doing justice. So how did you, how did you end up at a hedge fund, uh, transitioning oh, from a scientist God. to a hedge fund? Well, it's, um, it's a kind of a funny story. Um, so I was a scientist and I did drug development in this arena, uh, around viruses, gene therapy. And I was about 28 years old. And you wear a lot of hats when you're at a small biotech company doing this. And that, that's what I was doing. Uh, and I, we were successful in a very small group of us in getting two drugs into the clinic, uh, into humans. Uh, but I didn't know how remarkable and rare that was for a guy 28 years old. I, uh, you know, I was in the lab till 2 a.m. all the time. And it's because it was just a destiny, a journey, an adventure. Um, and I, I remember we had a big party and my, my boss, I, I was actually pretty disappointed uh, because I thought these two gene therapeutics that we made were going to fail in the clinic. And uh, they did actually later, uh, a couple of years later, uh, because that was the beginning of myself being critical about science and saying, yes, I made this. It's totally not going to work. But they had to go forward with it anyway, because we had to keep the company going. And a little bit eye-opening to me. And my boss at the party said, Mike, I've been doing this for 40 years. You should be really happy. I've never gotten anything into the humans in, in, in the clinicals. It's taken me 40 years. This is the peak of my career. And I looked at myself and thought, oh, there's got to be more than this. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was one of those moments at 28 years old where I had to really think critically and say, wait a minute, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? be in a laboratory, uh, working on very idiosyncratic things and esoteric that nobody understands except for a group of 15 people. Um, and the answer was not really. And so I started a scouring process to say, well, what can I do? What else is out there? And I discovered that this job existed, had no idea, had no idea you could take that knowledge and go and pick stocks. I didn't even know what a hedge fund was. So I said, well, I have to learn this finance thing. I hear it's important. So I went to business school, get, learns this finance thing. And then I learned very quickly as I went to Wall Street, oh, that finance thing, it actually really isn't important until 2008. And then you learned everything you learned in finance was wrong. <laughs> so, so it's really been a, you know, right from the get go, a trial by fire. Uh, where I landed in a spot at Oppenheimer Funds, who was kind enough to take me. And that was a very big operation. Uh, I got very fortunate in the stocks that I picked. I picked a, a little HIV company with some crappy compounds, but when you added them together, they would have a profound effect. And that was our bet. We ended up owning 5% of this little rinky dinky company 25 years ago called Gilead. Oh, wow. And Yes. And so we own about five or 6% of that company and it, you know, went up whatever, 50 times, a hundred times. And honestly, they thought I was a lot smarter than I was. And they made me the head of healthcare at, um, probably 31 Ooh. years old at a very, very large mutual fund and really took it from there. At that point, it was the true trial by fire because I didn't know anything about anything outside of drugs. And so I had to learn what an HMO was, what distributors were, what med tech was, and, you know, and really diversify and broaden out. And I was fortunate enough that I learned it fast enough that I could be successful before I got fired. And that's really what the business is about, is learning fast enough to be successful 
before you get fired. And, and that was really how I ended up doing that. Uh, and moving forward, there was a management turnover in, uh, at Oppenheimer Funds, I think in 04. And I said, oh my God, this is just too volatile for me. I think I'm going to go somewhere safer. I'll start going to hedge funds. And, <laughs> and that's how I ended up at a hedge fund, thinking that that was the safe bet. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, we see this all the time with our guests. We see people who come from areas outside of finance and then are very, very successful inside finance. I mean, do you think that gives you like an edge? The fact that you're not like a traditionally trained, I mean, I guess you went to school for it, but you're not a traditionally trained finance guy. You came from somewhere else and had the discipline of that you know, coming with you? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that I can, I, I, especially in the realm of anything science, I can see hurdles frequently that others can't. And I understand end markets and how these drugs will be used sometimes much better than others. And I've made most of my career off of those things for the past 20 years. Uh, but no, in the sense that I come in with a chip on my shoulder meaning that, oh, I already know this. I know how this is going to play out because that's not how stocks play out. Sometimes you can see incredibly, tragically horrific decisions being made that will send a stock up north for years before it craters. And all the whole thing about investing is not just knowing what's going to happen, but when. And the when is the key to humility. And that you might have figured it all out, but that doesn't mean you're going to get the stock right. And that's the hardest part. And I'll give you a great example about Moderna. That would be a, a fine example that was a modern rocket ship and uh, cratered, um, you know, and, and I was very vocal about this on a program such as Hedgeye on this coronavirus, where I was completely convinced it was laboratory made immediately as soon as I saw the gen most of the genetic sequence, I was just like, this absolutely could not have happened in nature. And uh, lone voice, uh, but turned out to be pretty much the case, which is happy that it, it did work out and we can now point fingers, which we should be doing. But aside from that, Moderna had a wonderful vaccine, as did others, and I had to figure out which one was going to be successful and more importantly, for how long. And my view was they'll get the first wave. And then they will never be able to make a vaccine again that is potent against the current variant, whichever that is sweeping through the world. And the big reason for it was, was that the sweep would take about four to five, six months to come through. And by the end of that time, well, Moderna will be done developing their new variant of the vaccine just in time to match a variant that has already left the human population. So they will never be able to meet, meet on time the variant coming through. And I knew that. And I knew that, that, but I knew that while they were vaccinating people, that Gen 2, 3, 4 of this would be zeros or near zero sellers. And, and so I had to put the bet on, on the back end. But heck, if you put it on too soon, you could have been out 500% uh, being short that for that move up. So... Yes, it's great to have a knowledge of the basis of where you could get in trouble and how it's going to play out, but that can hurt you if you don't get the timing right. So I always have to stay very cognizant of what the world is going to do to these stocks and figure out what they think. And then more importantly, when are they going to figure out what Pink already knows? And that's the inflection point. Uh, for instance, we owned a zero position in Moderna on the way down and a zero position in Pfizer on the way down, as everyone thought these vaccines would be much better. Uh, and that saved our investors about two to 300 basis points of performance. And, and that you can see that in, my co in the competition. And there are two major large healthcare specific uh, funds that are out there that trade as an ETF. And the performance, there is a meaningful delta between pink and the competition. And a lot of it is because of choosing when, not just being right, but choosing when. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we're quant investors, we're factor investors. And, and I was just thinking as you were giving that answer, like this is probably the sector where the, the quant investing probably works the worst of anything. Yeah. You know, thinking about what you have to think about for these, even the established drug companies to think about if they're going to be successful, but then going down to the ones that have drugs, you know, that maybe aren't profitable, 
you know, this is really not an area you could have probably, you know, apply quant investing. I mean, do you have any parts of your process where you screen or do anything like that? But, or is this all the ground up, you know, building up to your, your positions? Well, for the most part, there aren't names that surprise me, meaning, oh, well, Pfizer's screening X, Y, Z, so I should buy that. No, I, I, I know exactly what Pfizer is doing, what they've been doing, where they're going and their pipeline. So I'm not going to screen something and something's going to jump out at me and you need to own this group. Uh, sometimes you'll see great discrepancies, which is so rare, but we did see that in 22, uh, as, um, as COVID was still a problem, um, and nobody got their medical procedures done. And so med tech companies did absolutely terribly. Additionally, they had inflation problems where the, you know, the cost of titanium, the cost of all these inputs increased the cost of med tech products, but med tech bills hospitals at a fixed code. So they didn't have pricing power. So they had this huge problem where they had increased costs and no pricing power and uh, a slowdown in volumes. So med tech got absolutely destroyed in 22, uh, only to recover now in 23 and to now. So you had to be cognizant of that macro sort of factor and then put it on when the time was right. Uh, so, so I suppose I do uh, sort of try to understand the high level events that are happening. But for the most part, under normal circumstances, it's a very, very bottoms up space with very low correlations in their businesses between each other. Even though they trade together as a group frequently, it's not really the right way to look at it because the businesses frequently are quite different. Can, can you talk us through kind of within the sector breakout? Like we've talked about drugs and pharma, you have med tech, but what are the major, I guess, industry categories that make up the sector? If you were to try to sum them up in the top, I don't know, maybe five to eight, would you say? Well, I'd do it in three. Okay. Right. You have drugs. And people say pharma, biotech, spec pharma. No, nah, it's all drugs, just drugs, because they have all the same intellectual property issues and, and, and durations. So drugs. And then you have med tech. Med tech is everything where there is sticking something in you or doing surgery or, or filling a, a bin of tools inside of a hospital, right? And so that's med tech, medical technology. And then lastly, I group uh, the delivery of care. That's HMOs, that's hospitals, that's uh, going to be the distributors. And also I distribute, I, I put the, in that too, the tools component where it's the hardware that gets sold to the drug makers to do all the uh, sort of research and discoveries all over the world. And so that's how I, I, I view the world is drugs, med tech, and then everything else. You know, just, just a uh, quick side note, my wife had her ACL repaired basically probably about a year and a half ago at this point. And, you know, walking into one of those surgical centers, it is like a revolving door. And I was just like thinking to myself, if you want job security in this country, I mean, it seems like that's one of the places to be. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like people just coming in and it was almost like used car salesman type of tactics, it seemed like. Or that kind of stuff's crazy. I hope you didn't get the undercoating because you know that's the yeah we no we we didn't get upsold also sold on that. <laughs> She's the green puff, I swear. <laughs> uh, yes, amb that's called an ambulatory surgery center, and that is part of the delivery of care. And it, there's been um a, a, there's been a, a great growth in this in part because of the reimbursement, which is a little bit different than how you get this in a hospital. And then um, it actually ends up being more profitable if you have your own standalone center. So there is always gaming going on for the codes of how you deliver care. And those codes are set by uh, Medicare. Uh, so we have a, a huge boom in ambulatory uh, surgery centers. And it's actually worked out really well because you do have that high turnover and, and, and a low in, lower infection rate. So for instance, hospitals, uh, have a much higher infection rates because you have truly sick people sitting there for really long periods of time getting really weird bugs, all right? Really weird infections that fester and they're hard to get rid of. Well, you don't really want somebody coming in for, a, for a, an ACL uh, reconstruction 
on a floor with, with people that have uh, chronic long-term infections and sepsis and all that, because there's a probability that you, the ACL person is going to pick up one of these horrible bugs. So actually separating out those mm. ambulatory units from the stay in units like a hospital was actually a really good idea. Um, and sometimes the government is a little thoughtful like that on occasion, they'll get it right. So kudos to them. But yes, it is, it is, it's like, it's like a restaurant, right? Turn, turn them and burn them. You got to turn these tables to get them out of that chair, <laughs> you know, take the anesthesia down. So he wakes up real quick, you know, and, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, it's business, it's business. And in America, that's a beautiful thing. Before we ask you more about how you construct a portfolio, I just want to ask you about what's going on in healthcare at a high level. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of world changing things going on right now. It seems like a decade from now, we're going to have innovations that we might not even imagine are possible. And I'm just wondering, since you're inside of this, like, what mm -hmm. are the things you're most excited about in healthcare as we move forward, like in the next five to 10 years? Well, uh, there's a lot, that's an incredibly good question and very pertinent. And, and I think we should put to it first that, uh, innovation is the key. Innovation cannot happen with a heavy government hand. Innovation cannot happen when the, when let's say when the government chooses the drug price, for instance, if government came in and said, we're going to have national health care and we're going to choose the drug. There will never be innovation again. And this is what happened in all the other countries where, you know, very little is discovered outside the U.S. anymore in almost every realm of, um, of healthcare. It is here, the United States, that pulls off about 95% of all innovation. And so all the other pharma biotech businesses outside the U.S. is for the most part cratered in comparison to what the U.S. has been able to deliver. And part of that is that painful pricing issue, right? Where, oh, it's too expensive. Well, actually, for the most part, what's so expensive is everything new. That's what's really expensive. These drugs go off patent in 15 to 17 years, and they become generally very much cheaper. Uh, we're paying that premium of patent life in order to get innovation. Today, uh, the, uh, the pick du jour is GLP-1s, an amazing innovation that, it, that actually came out seven years ago. Uh, they just developed it to the, and it was available seven years ago. They just made the dosing a lot better over the past seven years to make it so it could be used for everyone, for the masses with a once weekly or even more infrequently in the, in the future uh, injection. Uh, so innovation is really the key to our, our success and the United States success. We export all this innovation all over the world and it's a building block to build the next thing which brings me to the next thing. And the next thing is we're in a golden age, a renaissance of discovery and development. We are able to take now from the, where do I have the whiteboard up? No, it's to my left, but uh, take from the whiteboard, a concept to the clinic in a period of two to three years. And that's like when I went back in the day, 20 years ago, it would take seven years to do that. And we do it with much, much better fidelity, meaning that we know much more about the compounds. We know much more about the toxicity. The animal models are far better, meaning that when you take it into the clinic and put it into humans, you have a pretty good idea what the risk really is. And so the hit rate on getting into humans and being successful is very, very high now. Uh, for instance, it's pretty rare for a drug to fail in phase three clinical trials now because we know so much about it by the time we get to phase three. 20 years ago, things failed in phase three all the time. And that's really the progress of the, the machinery and the science and the models all put together have generated incredible returns. Uh, so we're in a, an extremely exciting spot right now where we are starting to understand metabolism. We're understanding cancer. And the next thing we're going to really take a big leap on, and this is a little bit distance, not, but, but in our lifetime, uh, it is going to be aging, true aging as to why. Uh, and there's amazing early science going on this to here to try to figure that out. And I have all of my own personal views on where it's going to go and I'm watching very carefully, but that will be the next really big innovation 
will be aging. And that is going to change the face of humanity to have us age more gracefully over much longer periods of time. Uh, everything will change. And that will probably be the beginning of humans. Well, let's just say an incredible leap in technology. Just imagine if so many of our scientists that were brilliant, if they could turn their career into three or four X the duration. That would just be absolutely stunning outcomes for science and progress for humans. So that's going to be the big, big thing in healthcare over the not too distant future. But in the meantime, we have tremendous uh, treatments now for niche indications, not just big ones like GLP, but rare, rare things to treat rare, rare kinds of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for instance, and many other uh, very rare diseases that only affect 15, 20,000 people. Uh, but we can modify their lives, if not cure them or effectively cure them of these things with the drugs that are on the table right now and coming out very soon. So it's just an incredibly exciting time in healthcare. So you think on the, on the aging, we're going to be able to actually slow down the aging process once we better understand it. Is that the idea? Yes. yes. That's very, and so you think that that could lead to a significant increase, you know, both in lifespan and probably health span as well. You know, oh, the, yes. The, okay. Yes. It has a lot to do with um, the quiescence, this is my view, but, but I do read up on it on occasion, but I believe it has a lot to do with the quiescent cells. Um, we, we, the humans and actually all animals uh, have a energy saving mechanism for when, when your cells start to sputter out and die, they don't actually die. They just kind of hang out there and go idle. Uh, they call it quiescence. And the reason why they stay that way and go idle is because it costs so much energy for your immune system to walk in, kill it, and clean it up. So by the time you're 60, 70, 80, 100 years old, your body is jam-packed full of these quiescent cells, and your organs no longer function. Your skin looks old. That's the reason why your skin looks old. It's all these quiescent cells piling up on each other because it's much more uh, energetically efficient to leave them there rather than spend all the energy to clean it out and fix it. So I think that's going to be one of the giant directions that science is going to take us in cleaning up those quiescent cells. And we'll see our organs and skin and everything uh, improve. And the other one I want to follow up with is cancer. You know, because that's obviously one that's, as we mentioned at the beginning, that's touched a lot of our lives. I mean, do you think five, 10 years from now, we're going to have made major progress in terms of our ability to prevent, treat, you know, do everything we need to do around cancer? Yes. Um, you know, very likely 20 years from now, uh, cancer will be a, for, for most indications, um, just a disease that you endure, um, much like, um, an upset stomach. I don't know. Uh, you, you take your medicines for it and pretty much have a normal life or as normal as you can. We've seen this happen in many indications already. Uh, for instance, multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma was a uh, type of blood cancer where you would die in about five years and enough uh, unique, interesting drugs had come out uh, over the past 15 years where people don't die from multiple myeloma anymore. They die from old age. And so now that you got people multiple myeloma, 20, 30, 40, well, not 40 years out, but on drugs now we have them on 20, 25 years out. And uh, the condition is in check because of the drugs. That's what I think it's going to look like, where there very well may not be a cure to it, but you learn to put it in check and live with it and live your life. Eventually, there may be a cure, but I think in our lifetimes, 20 years from now, uh, it'll just be a pest that you have to get treated. We're all seeing a lot of innovation in AI right now. How, how much of an impact is that having in the healthcare space? Well, it never, uh, it never wasn't there. AI is not new. AI is only new to everybody because you can talk to a computer now and it tells you what your homework is, right? It'll help you cheat. And, uh, and that's why everyone's excited about AI. But AI has been there the whole time using computers and inferences to try to find things that humans can't see easily. And so there's always been tools employed by many companies to, uh, try to do just that, to spot things that humans can't see, correlations and such. So it's really just a progression. Uh, maybe they're more interested in it now because it's very buzzy and they'll spend more infrastructure on that, uh, but it, it never wasn't there. It's always been there. As long as the te technology was there to do it, 
uh, we were doing it always. You mentioned Ozempic and the GLP-1 drugs, which everybody is talking about right now. Like, how significant do you think the impact they're going to have going forward is? Um, substantial. I, I mean, for disclaimer, I'm on one. I'm on Manjaro by uh, Lilly. I think that's the best molecule of the bunch. And uh, it's helped me out an awful lot. So the, the I'll tell you, the, the big market, we already know what they're developing it for. There's a lot of new indications to come out. And of course, weight loss. But there's a whole bunch of other things that go with that. Um, the, the quality and productivity of your uh, nephrons or kidney issues. And then there's everything from sleep apnea to uh, many other things that can be treated by losing weight, uh, simply losing weight. And the way that this uh, molecule and system works is that it fools your body into thinking you are fuller. That's all. And so you end up eating less. In a, in a nutshell, that's what it does. And it's very, very well tolerated. Uh, but right now, the, the impediment to it is going to be government, uh, the Medicare, uh, covering GLP-1s for the elderly. It's not covered. Uh, so you have millions of people that should be on a GLP-1 not able to get it. And uh, good news for them is they also happen to be millions of registered voters. So I believe that it will be covered by Medicare in the not too distant future. And that's when you'll see millions of new patients coming on. And look, if you can lose that weight, you will have improved cardiovascular uh, factors, diabetic. I mean, you just go down the list. They'll, they'll, they'll be finding things in the data that they didn't even anticipate. Maybe it has an impact on Parkinson's disease, maybe Alzheimer's. Those are things that we can't find a direct correlation to right now, but you might be able to find it in the data. When they mine the data eight, eight seven, eight years from now, it might become clear that there's a trend. So I think it's a an enormous category. And the way that I look at it, I look at a lot of fast followers that are out there and there's not a lot, there's a handful. Um, but at issue is they're all going to be four years behind Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. And I really don't see anybody displacing them for the foreseeable future. I think it's a two player market and that's it. When you talk about all the stuff going on in healthcare, like I was thinking it's good we have experts like you to build portfolios and I don't have to do it because it seems like it's a challenge. You know, you've got established companies with established drugs. You've got companies with drugs that are way out in the future. You've got these three different areas. Like, how do you think about looking at all that and coming down to like a process to build a portfolio? Um, well, I do a real bottom up and a shotgun approach and then I look at everything. I don't have a theme. I'm, I'm reading constantly and monitoring what I like to call the soap opera that is, that is the whole scientific space in healthcare. And I will find uh, inconsistencies. So it's not just, and usually it's around new product stories or um, geographic expansion, things like that, where I can model it out and figure out uh, something that the street doesn't quite see or understand. And um, I'm a bit more aggressive with pink because it, I treat it like it's my own money and I'm here to have meaningful gains. And that's, uh, that's how I approach it. And so uh, sometimes I'll have position sizing that's a little bit larger than my competition, um, but it's always there for a reason and a very, very specific reason. Um, so, and I think that the results uh, demonstrate that. And so is it purely bottom up? I mean, we talked about those three groupings before. Do you think I like at the top high, high level, I want exposure to each one of these? Or do you just think I want to get good companies and I don't really care, you know, let it fall the way it falls? It changes. Uh, sometimes you do have to be very cognizant of that sort of grouping and benchmarking. Uh, but most of the time, I think that you don't. You really want to be um, doing a true bottom up approach and because that's the only way that I'm going to outperform them. For instance, if you look at the benchmarks and then look at my two nearest competitors, uh, they have a portfolio that looks very much like the benchmarks. Uh, and so what that tells me is that they're not really interested in outperforming too much, just a tiny bit. And that's good enough. Well, for pink and for our charity, that's not good enough. We have to do a heck of a lot better than that. And it's also my money. 
So I treat it as if it is mine. And I bet just like that I did for the past 20 years in running a hedge fund. I guess the obvious answer is you're not doing shorting anymore. But other than that, what is the biggest difference between when you ran the hedge fund and, and what you're doing with Pink? Or is it very similar? Um, it, it, it is different. It is much less volatile. Um, the, the names that I have in our book, um, the ones that let's say have binary risk to them are smaller and there are fewer of them. Uh, and so, and, and big reason of that is that I can't hedge. So I could do very exotic things when I was at a hedge fund, you know, I'd have a view on something, I'd have a view on timing. And then I go out there with a 10,000 calendar call spread. And, and I was, a I was known as one of the very large option traders out there in healthcare. Uh, and I, I actually said, people don't do options anymore. <laughs> I'm a, except for like the, the daily ones on the ETFs. But I, as I watch it in the names, there aren't as many options traded anymore in individual names. Kind of surprising. But, uh, but yeah, so I, it is different and that the risk profile is different because the hedging profile is different. So, but, but the risk that I do put on, it is out there for a very specific reason. And frequently it's something that the street doesn't understand yet. But I do get a lot of questions on it. Like when I do something in the book, it appears the next day publicly, you know, that I did this or I did that. And I get a lot of calls on it sometimes. What are you thinking with this? Right? Because all the hedge fund guys, they know who I am. I mean, I competed against them for 20 years. So they're so. screening against your public holdings to see what oh, you're yeah. adding and stuff. Yeah. Yes. What are you doing? Absolutely. One day later. Yes. Whatever I'm doing, uh, they're watching. And, uh, and it's, it's good. Uh, look, I have a lot of people that I've trained and, and work with. There's many of the people that have worked for me are very successful running their own hedge funds and, uh, or there are very large, uh, books within a jar, giant hedge fund, uh, and I, I talk to them every day. They're my best friends. We're all still part of Critical Mass, which was the fund that I ran. How do you think about concentration? You know, we run concentrated portfolios and we're always striking this balance between, you know, we want to be very concentrated, but we also want to think about like, we've got end investors using these things and they've got to be able to stick with whatever it is we're doing. Like, like how do you think about concentration when, when you're building a portfolio like this? Well, I'll submit when you got the nuts, you got to go big. That's it. When you see something that is some of the street doesn't understand and it's very differentiated, um, you, you don't have to go big then at that moment, right? You have to go big as soon as they start to figure out what you already know and you'll see it in the stock. And that's, that's frequently what I'll do. You never want to be the first one who's buying into a good idea because you'll never get the bottom. You'll never get the bottom. And same thing with exiting. You'll never get the top. Uh, my goal is to get the in-between. And sometimes that in-between can last for years rather than months. So I think an awful lot about that, but I'm very cognizant that I'm not going to whip it around and do it with perfect flair. Uh, so frequently I will wait until I see it. And then I understand what everyone else is seeing. Okay. They're basically seeing the homework that we already had done and, uh, and, then, and then taking action. So will you typically start with a small position and then you'll kind of add over time? Um, is that your typical profile? It depends. I'll give you an example. This week, uh, I bought a five, four percent position in Cooper companies. Uh, this was last week, late last week. Um, it's a contact lens maker. Uh, one of about three. It's, it's kind of like a oligopoly, a, if you will, a cartel. <laughs> I think it's more a cartel, the contact lens cartel. And, uh, Cooper companies, uh, is a share gainer, uh, and a manu because manufacturing is an issue for all these guys and a price taker, the whole group is taking small price. So I look at where the street is models. I look at what they're doing and there's a big disconnect. And I've been watching a stock, watching a stock, and it came in very sharply into the quarter. And I was like, they're all wrong. This is just hedge funds, uh, getting afraid and shaking it out. And I walked in with a 4% position overnight and, um, they smoked the quarter and they're going, and in fact, the street numbers didn't come up enough. They only came up to 8% growth for this year and 7% for next year. This needs to be in the low double digits, 11 to 12. Well, that has a profound impact through the P and L. 
So I now have a 5% position in Cooper. I think it needs to go up about 40% between here and year end. So normally I don't put on 4% overnight, but the opportunity was there because they sold this thing 8% into the quarter, like a straight line over two or three days. And I said, they're all wrong. This is the entry point, go. And I don't always do that, but I have to, hey, look, we're here to make money, right? So sometimes I have to do it because the, the market is telling me I have to do it. How do you think about valuation? I mean, that would seem like an interesting thing with these types of companies. I mean, you have to figure out what the street thinks about what's going on versus what you think about what is going on. But how do you think about valuation, like in evaluating potential opportunities in healthcare? Well, in healthcare, there's basically two. Huh. I'll give you an example. I'm long Thermo Electron, TMO. Thermo Electron and all the other tools companies like it have guided to a hockey stick and growth in the back half of the year because the front half's going to stink. Now, why they all think we're going to have a hockey stick event in the back half of the year and growth, I have no idea. I literally have no idea. I, I think they're, they're all just looking at each other like, yeah, back half, right? 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 It's trading at 25 times forward for a single digit grower. So Apple is trading at 24 times forward for a no digit grower. I'm not sure how much valuation makes sense in this market. And if I simply invested on valuation metrics, I would have underperformed horrifically, just terribly. And our investors would have been very, very upset. So it's really my job to understand when valuation matters and when it doesn't matter so much. Basically what I'm looking for in a nutshell is simply meaningful earnings revisions to outer year numbers. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, and it's going to happen around usually new product stories uh, or pricing or a market expansion that many don't see. And that takes place in med tech, in uh, drugs and all of them. Um, and that's really what I'm looking for. And, but betting on valuation alone is a very, very good way to put up very, very bad returns. Just wondering about that, that idea you talked about with valuation, because that's something that like those of us that are fundamental investors have been thinking about for a long time. This, this idea that fundamentals and valuation matter a lot less in the market than they used to. And there's a lot of reasons for that, including, you know, some of Mike Green's work who we just recently had on. But I'm just wondering what, what you think about that idea that your know, fundamentals matter less in the market when you're evaluating individual companies than they used to in the past. Um, well, what we're talking about in valuation is essentially the discounted future free cash flows, right? I mean, that, that is what valuation is. How much am I paying for those future cash flows? Um, we've gotten into a world over the past 15 years where we now have two generations of investors that have never seen a down market. And the view is, is that the government will never let, sto let stocks go down, ever. Uh, history disagrees, but you get these moments in time where valuation doesn't matter because the government has not let stocks go down. And, and it's very important to learn from that and listen to when they might be faked out, when the government can't come in to overspend by two and a half trillion dollars. That time is very likely next year. The street doesn't know it. And I'm asking myself right now, when are they gonna figure it out? And that's what I'm spending a lot of time or at least a lot of thought on. When are they going to figure it out that we have impossible comps for 25? We have a high yield wall of refis that are gonna be ugly as all heck. And it's just gonna grow every year from next year. And then we have a, a growing uh, commercial real estate disaster that's underway. Uh, which is going to affect virtually every mid-sized bank in the country. Uh, those are all going to be really big issues to think about, and valuation may come into play at that time. So for our pink investors, I am cognizant, I am watching, and we'll get it right. I wanted to go back to 
the point on binary risk. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot of investors out there, retail investors in particular, you know, they dabble in these biotechs and every, you know, looking for this company has this blockbuster drug and, you know, is it public yet? And, you know, you get the stories that, you know, people think they're going to, they're, they're going to find the next Gilead. But just talk about that concept of binary risk and why it's so important in managing risk, particularly with the, some of these types of companies. Well, especially in the drug arena, we're actually faced with binary risk all the time uh, and you don't know it. Uh, I'll give you an example. Do you remember that drug called Vioxx by Merck? It was a pain drug, a uh, COX-2 inhibitor, and it probably never should have been uh, approved. Uh, because it had it caused uh, serious GI issues, but it all it, uh, it caused a heck of a lot more than that. It it caused uh, heart issues uh, in the data, and they they pulled the drug uh, overnight, just good night, and Vioxx is pulled from the market, and massive lawsuits and so forth. And so a company as big as Pfizer or uh, Merck rather, that was Merck's drug, uh, absolutely blew up, and nobody saw it coming, and you know it's down thirty percent in a day. Uh, and that is one of the issues that we always deal with in uh, the drug world is that stuff can go wrong that you couldn't have seen coming. Uh, it's rarer for the med tech world um, because you don't have what I like to call a purple eyeball. Meaning if you look at enough patients in a study, you're going to find somebody who has a purple eyeball that's unexplainable and the drug needs to be pulled from the market. And that's, I always joke about that on the desk. Where's the purple eyeball? Where's the purple eyeball? You don't get that in med tech. Um, you only get that in the drug arena. So we actually deal with uh, all the time binary risk, whether we know it or not, especially in the drug arena. But there is a lot of money uh, to be made, a lot of returns to be made in getting these sort of things right. And when I do bet on it, I usually bet quite small because I find the real money is made not on a binary event. All of it's made after the event. There's only so many people that can play that binary event, meaning hedge funds and retail. Uh, but the really big money is made figuring out what the actual end market is going to be and what that will look like over many, many, many years. That's really where the vast majority of my money is made. And, and, and the company you mentioned earlier, Cooper, while that, they're not probably uh, susceptible to that binary event, they do have me as part of the arm twisting with, uh, as a contact where... They, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, I think I've probably bought, you know, years and years of contacts from those guys at 300 bucks a, a pop and there's no other options out there. So, so you're think, taking the dailies. Well, and I use, actually I use the monthly, monthly okay. ones, but I, yeah. And there's always rebates in there and, you know, but they're still expensive. Yeah. You know? No, it's really expensive. Yeah. The dailies are really taking off. I don't know why, but. <laughs> well, it might be because, you know, it's kind of, you use them for a day, you, you discard them. And I do know that, you know, I'm not good about when I should be taking these in and out. So I think they kind of get dirty mm -hmm. and kind of start to irritate your eyes. That's when I kind of use, that's my signal. It's like, okay, I've been wearing these things too long. Time to discard them. So anyways, okay. but uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never used contacts, but that's helpful. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit more just about, I guess, the macro landscape. It sounds like, you know, you've got some concerns looking out over the next 12 to 18 months. What's your current, um, where are you on where inflation's at right now? Um, there's a lot of pulls in inflation. Uh, I mean, the, the biggest one that I think we're going to have to deal with, uh, over the next uh, years is, uh, deglobalization. And that is going to have a profound impact on the cost of things being made. Uh, and we're enduring it right now. And that's why I think in part, the uh, wage growth is pretty sticky. So I, I think that that is going to be a problem and not something that the Fed really anticipated. None of this is part of their model. They have like 150 PhDs and I have no idea what model they're putting out because the Fed's been essentially wrong on everything forever. They, you know, it's whatever this latest data point, that's what they say moves forward. That's what I literally think how, how they think. So if it's good, great, we're going to cut rates. And if it's bad, oh no, we're going to hike rates or pause, you know? So they see no further than the data point that happens this week. So that's a huge issue for us. Uh, I think inflation has to abate though a bit. 
but it's still going to remain sticky. I think we're really stuck in a 3% plus environment for inflation. Um, and, and more importantly, though, it's how it affects us in the real world. And the real world is our federal government has to find another $30 trillion to borrow over the next 10 years or so. And 45% of it or so has to come from overseas. Uh, so we're going to have to offer a meaningful interest rate in order to get their attention and their purchase. We need it. And so it's, if they're going to run up debts like that, and I think they have to, we're in a real pickle. Uh, we're also in a real pickle come 25 and we have an economic slowdown that's pretty meaningful at the same time. Uh, what happens when the Fed starts printing money? Do we turn into a Japan where we just can't stop ever printing money? And I think that that's highly probable that it'll be politically impossible to stop printing money. And that's my biggest fear at the same time, though it would be tremendous for stocks. You know, if we have a government overspending and printing money at the same time, and they don't really care about inflation, I think that that's, that's exactly what's happened in Japan, where they're like, there's terror, you know, they, they want to get inflation. Now they get inflation. Oh, we can stop printing. No, we're going to print even more money. They printed more money when they got inflation in order to suppress the yield curve. So they're in this incredible cerebral pickle where they want to perpetually lie to us and have us buy it, but the story is getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, but they cannot stop printing because all the assets will collapse immediately. Uh, I'm afraid the U.S. will um, will turn into a very sane predicament because it's much more politically expedient to simply uh, print because stocks go up and then everyone's happy, even if there is inflation. So that's the trade that they'll probably take. And that's what I think is going to happen. You know, I don't know if it would have been possible and I don't know if the market really took him seriously at the time, but there was a point where when rates were at like one or 2% and Trump was in office and he was saying, you know, let's issue, I don't know how much in debt to try to, you know, lock these low interest rates in. And I don't know if mechanically it could have been done. I'm not that familiar with government issuance and things like that, but you know, at 5%, versus 1%, you know, and where interest rate, co interest rate expense costs are for the mm -hmm. country. It might, might not have been a bad, bad idea. Um, and speaking of Trump and, and maybe politics a little bit, do you have any thoughts on the way the market might react to possible election outcomes? Um, well, I think th what has happened over the past four years actually, uh, is a an incredible fiscal effort to get uh, the current administration reelected, whether it be not paying back student loans or dumping the SPR when we never really needed to ever, or, uh, or running the, the financing of the treasury all on the short end of the yield curve to offset quantitative tightening or wildly overspending during a peak employment period. Uh, in order to goose everything you could possibly imagine right up to November. And it all ends right after November, you know, build back better comps. Um, you know, the SPR needs to be re, um, refilled. That's the petroleum reserve. And, uh, the treasury is going to be held pretty, pretty tough on the short end of the yield curve. So whoever walks in is getting a flaming bag of dog shit in my view and saying, thank you, come again, you know, and that's it, uh, where you're walking into, uh, a, a, you know, a refi cycle and high yield that's crap, uh, the, you're, you're a massively overspent government, which is going to have real difficulty doing an encore next year. They, remember if they're going to do it next year, they actually have to have it done this year to budget for next year. And my bet is that nothing's going to happen to that degree, even remotely. So it's already going to be cast, but 25 is going to be tough. So we just have an incredible number of headwinds walking into whoever takes office. And don't forget, we have the Trump tax cuts, which expire, um, I think, in the spring of next year. They were only deemed temporary, everything, everyone thinks forever, but that's going to have to be trillions of dollars of uh, debt that they're going to have to find to spend to keep those alive. Uh, I, and I, I think there will be great uncertainty at that point in time that they will be. I think that'll be a big overhang for next year in the, in the tape. 
flaming flaming bag of dog shit. That is the first on the excess returns podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you get to claim that, Mike. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. That really guy, whoever takes that old office, oh mm-hmm. God help them. God help them. So well, listen, we um we like to ask all of our guests sort of a standard closing question. And that is based on your experience in the markets. If you could teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? The most important thing to being a successful investor is booking your gains. That's it. Booking your gains. Also, secondarily is also containing your losses, but You cannot make money unless you actually make money and you do so by booking gains. Never be afraid of it. You can always go back and buy it again tomorrow. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Mike. Really appreciate it. It was a real pleasure being here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.